Aldous, <laughs> welcome to the Middleburg Film Festival. And Thank you. As the recipient of the Spotlight Actor Award, we're sorry we're not both in Middleburg right now, but thanks yep. for virtually joining us. Yeah, man. I'm happy to be here, brother. It's uh, Look, any way I can get there by any means is a blessing, so I'm here. What's happening? Okay. We'll have you in person next time. Absolutely. Um, I want to ask you a story about your break into acting. As I mm -hmm. understand it, it was a magazine photo shoot. Mm -hmm. Your older brother was inclined. You were not. Mm -hmm. And does it come down to an action figure? Do we have Batman to thank for your acting career? Yeah, uh, we do. And, and technically it's crazy because, um, yeah, it, I think it was an Essence photo shoot. My brother was three, I was two. They needed an extra kid. And they were asking on the set and I was there, you know. And my mom's like, you know, you want to go take the picture? And me, I'm like, mm, it's not my thing, you know. But I was trying to be like my big brother too, my brother Edwin Hodge, um, who, by the way, has a fantastic film about to come out uh hopefully next year called tomorrow war starring chris pratt and himself anyway shameless plug don't care um so my mom convinced me by uh you know if you just take this just one picture you know i get a batman toy and i was like you know yeah i'm i'm a hustler <laughs> yeah i'm gonna get this batman toy and it's very strange that now i co-produce my show uh City on the Hill with Batman, Ben Affleck. <laughs> and um, like, I can't, I can't speak to the future, but uh, we might be crossing over in alternate universes when it comes to, to that, uh, that whole world. Pretty, you know, maybe we'll see. Wow. So a Batman toy and yeah. had she not offered the toy, who knows what you'd be doing now? Who something I'm knows? sure, something I'm sure that would be very interesting. I want to also ask hey. you about an early acting gig you had. It was on uh, Broadway mm -hmm. in the musical Showboat. Um, yeah. And Showboat. I believe, if I don't have this wrong, Samuel L. Jackson recommended to your mom that when you were filming Die Hard with a Vengeance, that mm -hmm. you do something on stage. I don't think you were 10 yet. So, wow. how important was Showboat? And I looked it up. The cast then included Elaine Stritch, John yeah. McMartin, Michelle Rebecca Bell. Luker. Yeah. Great cast. Yeah, what did that man. mean to you in yeah. terms of your acting education? I believe we were directed by uh, Harold Prince as well. So um, we were shooting Die Hard with a Vengeance. Um, I was playing Sam's nephew in the film. And my mom was asking about, you know, just tips and acting things, you know, how we can move forward as young actors, right? So, you know, thank you to Sam. He gave us the game. He told my mom, if you boys want to learn, you know, real acting, get them on stage. So coincidentally enough, after fi finishing the film, we go to an audition. Uh, where my brother gets the job and we get to see the contract just for six months. My mom was like, she thought it was a commercial. She was like, what kind of commercial takes six months to shoot? But then we realized it was Broadway, you know? So my brother had the job first and then about a year into it, cause we did about uh there was a two and a half year tour on Broadway, about a year into it, um, one of the other kids aged out and I was old enough. At this point, I think I was nine years old. I was old enough to, to join the cast. So my brother and I both, um, did showboat on Broadway for that next year and a half. And, you know, it's fantastic because it does set up your instincts and your foundation for who you are as a performer, how you're going to attack your craft, how to connect with the audience because they're there every single night. And if you mess up, you make a mistake, they see it, they feel it. There's no camera to hide behind, take one, take two, you know? Um, there were many times we had to start thinking on our feet and improv is a fantastic vehicle for understanding stage because I remember there would be times where I run out on stage, you forget something, but you still got to play it off. Like I forgot a prop or a tool or whatever. And you know, the kid inside me wants to cry, but I'm on stage and I can't. Or one time when I was running up a, a ramp and there's an actress who's supposed to be chasing me running behind me, I tripped and fell. I'm like all of nine years old, two pounds wet, soaking wet, like you nothing, right? She tripped, she fell on top of me, covered me clearly. I was, I disappeared. My mom is in the audience like, what is happening with my baby? Like, where's he at? Anyway, you play that off. You know what I mean? You get up, you run back again. And it was, it was great fun. It was me and my brother handling business, two kids with this magnificent show. You have an entire stage just moving and changing. So your imagination is like exploding, but you also understand the true essence of performance. As, as an actor, as an artist, and what we're doing and the immediate gratification you get from the audience when they, they feel you. So, and you have to know yourself. 
So that really helps solidify the foundation for us and our, our, our ambitions for film and television just grew out of that because we knew we wanted more. We wanted to progress and, uh, you know, it just, um, we had the right setup. So thank you, Sam, for the, for the advice. And thank you, mom, for always support. Mom is a G, you know. Um, and you're also getting to watch very good actors every night do what they do, noticing how they prepare, yeah. noticing Studying. how they connect. So it's almost like you do mm -hmm. four years of drama school in probably less than a year because you're doing it every night. Yeah. yeah, to a degree. Absolutely. And, you know, for anybody, I mean, for me, when it comes to acting, anybody who wants to act, I always tell them straight off, if you're trying to be rich or famous, go do something else. Don't waste your own time and potential on anybody else's. If you're trying to contribute something to the craft of entertainment and acting, sure, jump on in. You know, be a student. The moment your art begins to die is the moment you think that you know everything. You have to be a consummate student at all times. You get to watch other people. You get to learn and grow, and you have to stay training. Um, but to be a child in that position, to watch these artists, every night you're doing the same show, eight shows a week, and you have to figure out how to make it fresh every night. That's a craft all in itself. So to watch how they change subtle nuances gives you the tools to figure out how to give the same performance and a take when you're shooting a film, but change things so subtly that it makes a huge difference, but you maintain you know, your, your journey of building who this character is constantly and evolving. And that's what it really is about. It's about the evolution of your craft. Stage really does give you that. I remember having a conversation with the producer of the Harry Potter films. I think I was on the set of the third movie and he was talking mm -hmm. about the young actors who are playing Harry, Hermione and Ron. And yeah. he said, you don't cast the kid, you cast the family. That one mm -hmm. of the perils of being a young actor and you were a young actor doing Sesame Street and Showboat is that your world is so warped and different. You're in this bubble that doesn't have any real connection to reality. And I wonder if you believe that that's true, that having a solid family, having good people around you is just as important as what it is you're doing yourself as a young performer. Yeah, so for me, um, the family foundation is paramount. My mom always made sure that we were children first and that we had uh, a, a solid childhood. You know, sometimes you get wrapped up on set. Other people around you want to treat you like an adult, but my mom will put a stop to that at all costs. Um, she always made sure that education was the priority and acting was the privilege. We had to earn it like any sport or any musical instrument. If you're going to do it, you're going to do it well. This, you're not you know, going to waste your own time with this or mine, you know, uh, as our parent. And she made sure that we had to earn it. If we were coming home with like, First of all, there was no coming home with C's and D's and F's. No, if we came home with bad grades, we're not going on an audition at all. You know, she, she made sure that we understood we were making a choice for ourselves, but we had to understand what this choice was. We had to understand what we were engaging, understand, educate ourselves to learn how to read those contracts, you know, make sure that money was right because we were young businessmen and she was raising young businessmen. She was teaching us entrepreneurship at a very young age and she was never putting the cart before the horse. It was never that the business was the whole grand um, goal. It was raising two successful men who understood how to handle their business. That was her job. And she did her job excellently. Uh, we, we couldn't have been blessed with a, with a better mom, but that's because she had her priorities straight. She knew it was up and she never let anybody else interfere with that. A couple of years later, you're studying not far from where I am right now at the Art Center College of Design up yeah, on man. Lita Street off Linda Vista, literally a, a mile from my house. And yeah. you're thinking about an, being an architect and thinking about designing. Yeah. You become an architect in a different way, don't you? You start building <laughs> characters rather than houses. Yeah, yeah, and did you ever yeah. think about that, that part of what you have through that training mm. is the ability to design from the ground up, to build a foundation, then start building on top of that. And that's mm -hmm. how you approach creating a character. Yeah, for me, um, so I say this oftentimes, art is my language. Um, one time somebody said that it was cheesy. And I was like, it may be cheesy to you, but it's true for me. It's my language, it's how I connect. I was not very um, social when I was a child. I, I wasn't very engaging with people. 
didn't know how to figure people out, but I could figure things out. I knew how to, you know, if I could build it, figure out how to build it, I could, you know, figure it out. Um, so art to me has different sort of conduits. Architecture is practical, uh, mathematical conduit for it. Um, acting is an emotional conduit for my art. And it's all the exact same thing to me. I just have different ways of executing. So in my mind, yes, I am building different characters. I want to perform a role so well that when I watch it, I don't know who I am. I don't want to see myself in it whatsoever. So every role that I take on, I'm like, okay, here's an opportunity to, to, to build on that, to expound on, on, on the tools that I have and make them grow and try to figure out who this person is, because that's what you're doing. You're building a, a whole human being and the choices they make, the backstory, whatever that may be, um, how they respond to things, how they receive information, all of these little, little details, which are actually grand details, make up the big picture. So um, I was always, you know, inclined to design and acting just fell into it. I mean, acting has, has been my most, um, intimate relationship that, that, that I've had in my entire life, meaning intimate and not romancy, but in terms of closeness and, and, and sort of uh, value, uh, because it's been there since I was two, you know, and architecture came a little later when I was 12. And I started interning at an architecture firm around 13, uh, between 13 and 15 years old. So building has been my passion because growing up the way we grew up, we weren't always uh, afforded certain things or had access to certain information programs things like this and i knew what i wanted and i said if i can't get it or if it's not going to be given to me i have to build it that's where architecture came that's where eventually watchmaking came and that's where acting came i didn't see the opportunities for myself i didn't see myself on tv in the ways i wanted to be seen so i had to build it i want to ask you about people who believed in you at an earlier critical moment in your mm -hmm. career i want to ask about a showrunner named john rogers who worked on a series called Leverage. He co-created it <laughs> and was the showrunner on Leverage. And John Rogers did something yeah. that I think you believe was key in your career. What did he do and why was that so important? Um, so John, uh, I, I really, first of all, you know, with the Leverage crew, you know, from Dean Devlin to Chris Downey, who co-created the show, Chris Downey co-created the show with John Rogers. Uh, Dean um, is, you know, the band who produced the show and, and put it on. Um, I got I got nothing but respect for the guys because they all had faith in me. They they saw my potential. But I remember there was an actor who had already had the role, I believe, when I was auditioning for that. And then John, um, I remember auditioning for him. And he's the one who went to the table and was like, look, this kid has got it. You know, um, he's got the timing. You know, he, he went to bat. Dean saw it. He said, okay, you know what, you're right. I got a problem. I thought I had an active, but now we got to make a shift because, you know, John told me, look, some nine times out of 10, the right actor for the role doesn't always get the role. In this particular instance, we wanted to choose the right actor for the role. So I was, I was quite ambitious in my 20s. I was trying to be a staff writer at the same time that I was doing the show. I did leverage from starting at 21. We did it for five seasons. Now we're doing the reboot. Crazy. Like, We've been, uh, we stopped in 2012 and now we just started the reboot in 2020. It's crazy. But uh, through those years, John was always a guy that I called whenever it came to trying to shape my, myself as a writer, pitch meetings, things like that. I remember I had a pitch meeting for Marvel, uh, I think around 22 or something like that, because I grew up on graphic novels. I knew all the Marvel stuff, all the DC stuff. And, you know, they were just coming off of, uh, I think it was the X-Men, Dark Phoenix. I was like, look, there's only one way you guys can go with <laughs> this story. So um, I put together, I wrote a couple pages, put together a pitch document and all that. And I went to John and he uh, prepared me. So I actually had a meeting and um, it was a different team than the Marvel. We know now that it, it was a different team then. But, uh, you know, for me, of course, I, I didn't sell a script. Doesn't matter. I got a meeting. That's all I cared about. I got a meeting. And, you know, John saw my potential. He didn't turn me away. He didn't think it was a pipe dream. And, you know, still to this day, I counsel John because now, I mean, John is primarily, you know, he's he's a showrunner. He's a guy that it's going to, you know, you got a show, it's going through some stuff. He's going to help you fix it. You know, um, I think his passion right now is helping rear 
you know, writers, rear baby writers into senior writers so they can go off and do their own thing. He's got a fantastic company he's doing that with. And um, from for me, I started as somebody who wanted to be a, a, a writer and he helped me with that. But then I saw how John worked and I said, oh, he's a good showrunner. He's a fair man. That's who I want to be. I want to be the guy creating jobs and putting people in, in, in seats where they can actually create a career. So through the years, as I have grown in my career from, you know, just, you know, hustling up that act into to now being a producer and developing my own projects, I still counsel John to say, look, man, I'm trying to write it for this, I'm trying to develop this story. I need to produce. How do I handle that? And I'll talk to John, you know, um, and, you know, outside of, look, my family is my, my 100% down foundation. Like my family is all day the most powerful force that I have in my life. But outside of my family, up next, there are a few people in my life, in my career, who have been very supportive in very um, in, in nuanced ways that are refreshing. And, and John is one of those guys. I want to read you something you said a couple of years ago um, about how you decide what you want to do and why those things are important. Here's what mm. you said. The impact of what we do is to a degree our responsibility. You mm. always want to have a positive impact. What you do on screen helps to influence how people see things in their daily lives, and it could alter their perception to thinking. What I rejected before because I didn't understand it has now become something that I do understand. Mm. Given what you said there, and I love what you said, how does a movie like One Night in Miami factor into that thinking about impact and understanding and changing the way people might see the world? Hold on. I think I lost you. Hello? Oh, I'm here. Okay, so you I said can... how does it factor into impact, and that's where I lost you. Yeah, yeah. So how do what you say change your let me say it again so given what you said how does that factor into a movie like one night in miami and what you want it to say how you want it to speak to audiences and maybe the conversations you hope it might start oh man it's um it's everything you know as as someone who's ambitious in this business about trying to really lay out a fantastic career opportunities that i wanted were not always there. So there's a time in my career I had to tell my agents and manager that I'm not going out for the thug, the this, the that, the athlete, you know, because that's all that was there. I wanted to go out for other areas uh, of, of creative outlets that were true to me, but, you know, it wasn't common to see the black doctor, the black da da da. But, and that's another thing that, you know, is, is detrimental is that every time growing up again, I saw that we were in a space where we are a lawyer, a doctor. It always was the black guy, the black this, that why is my color so important to you? Well, it's, it's exhausting having to explain that and having to be validated in a particular position by my color. He's a doctor, but he's black. Da, da. It's frustrating because, you know, it's just be honest. We don't see that mostly with Caucasian actors, they don't have to explain why they're in a position. They're just there normalcy that's what i wanted from me so i started making choices based on my concept of what i call effective art what is going to represent me in the way that i see to be true in a way that's actually going to help shape how we are perceived in this industry how we're perceived in the world how we are considered when it comes to opportunities and jobs does it always have to be oh we need inclusion so let's put black people here or is it going to eventually get to the point where you just think of us normally because we operate normally in the world and we're just there because that's how it should be right so all that to be said i like to take uh, on projects that speak towards that progression that i feel have the weight and the power to do that and not every project is going to carry the same value. Not everyone is going to carry the same uh, efficacy when it comes to the message. Um, some are just going to be for entertainment's sake, but at the end of the day, they all push towards the same goal, which is open, equal opportunity. And when it comes to One Night in Miami, 
the thing that I love about this is it speaks so currently to the time. It speaks so currently to what we've all been going through, how I was raised, what we have been fighting for forever and fighting through forever. I think it exposes people to a, a private conversation where we as men, who people think are these grand patriarchs, these legends, and they are, they absolutely are, but they're still black men in America. And they're still dealing with things that black culture deals with in America. They're not absolved. So they are having a real conversation about their responsibility to themselves, to each other, to their community, which is a beautiful thing. We get to learn how they have debates and differences and we get to see how they can have that conversation, how they can positively and progressively get through differences and find sort of a, a, a commonality, common ground, if you will, which I love because it's so representative of the example that needs to be set for our culture and community now and other cultures who are curious about what we're going through in terms of how to have the conversation. So I feel like the potential of this film to do good, to be an asset, to actually help is massive. And I find it a great privilege and an honor to have even been a part of this film and to specifically be a part of this film in this particular time, especially this year. One of the things that happens in the film is there's a conversation between Malcolm X and Sam Cooke, the singer. Yes. And Malcolm X says to Sam Cooke, how are you going to use your voice? Mm -hmm. How are you going to use your voice to bring about change? And yeah. I won't say what the payoff is, but there's a payoff. <laughs> Sam Cooke yeah. hears what he says and takes it to heart. But it, yeah. it got me thinking about artists more broadly, about using your voice and about how you as an actor decide the things you want to be a part of and the things you don't want to be a part of. And sometimes it's money, sometimes it's the script, sometimes it's story, sometimes crazy director I don't want to work with. But more and more, do you find yourself, I'm thinking of Clemency, Brian B Banks, One Night in Miami, do you find yourself gravita gravitating more to stories where you are using your voice as an actor to, to spotlight equity, inclusion, mm -hmm. fairness, justice, any of those things? Um... I would say yes and no. Yes, in the form that I actively do search for projects like that. And I love when it happens. And I say no in the sense that I'm not responsible for all of these choices coming to me. Sometimes I'm just lucky that they approach me. You know, with, with Clemency, they've been working on it, I think, for three or four years at that point. And I received a beautifully written letter from Chinoya Chuku, our writer, director, visionary. And she spoke of her support of, of me, particularly, you know, in, in, in my work in, in terms of taking the role. And she sent me the script. It was excellent. And that was pure luck. You know what I'm saying? But like I said, they've been working on it for like three or four years. It came at a very specific time. Had it been like three or four years before that, I don't know. You know what I mean? There, there are things that happen that are completely out of my control that make things pop up right time, right place, right moment. Right. I was ready to do the work then. But. I'm not always responsible for certain things. I remember when Brian Banks came up, the audition happened and I was like, this is one that I really wanna get. I was very surprised and shocked when I got it because very few times does that happen. When I say, I'm going for this, I'm, I want it, it's mine. And it happens, you know, I was very lucky with that. And, you know, I do look for work that serves a purpose in different, different ways. Um, if it has the potential to speak to to, 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 to properly articulate what's going on in culture in a way where we can actually try to help, that's gold. Again, like I said before, if it's for entertainment's sake, people still need to laugh. They need to cry. They, they need to, to watch a movie and be scared and have something to talk with their friends about later. You know what I mean? So if we can have that, you know, you take a movie like Invisible Man, which was greatly suspenseful. People had a lot of fun with it. And that's the thing that I love is when people talk about that. Oh, my God, I was, ah, I was scared. And, ah, you know, and they have so much fun with it. That's a part of the healing process, too. As artists, when you're having a stressful day, you can come home and, and you turn on the TV and you just lose all the stress for a minute because you get lost in your show or you move it. That's a part of the healing process. So it all serves different things. I just want to make sure that whatever it serves um, outwardly, it also serves inwardly and that I'm trying to move towards a very specific goal with myself as a human being, as a man and as a business person. 
And I'm hoping that they continue to check our boxes as I take my steps forward. Before I ask you about playing Jim Brown, I want to ask you about being on set of this film on One Night in Miami. The story is set in 1964, and it's during segregation. And the story unfolds in what we'll call a Green Book Hotel because it was the only place blacks could stay, the Hampton House in Miami. Mm -hmm. And on set, in when you're filming this, you have four black actors, you have a black female director, Regina King, Mm -hmm. Kemp Powers, your playwright and screenwriter is a black man. Your composer is Ter- Terrence Blanchard, a black man. Your casting director, Kimberly Harden, is black. Your costume designer, Francine Jameson Tanchuk, is black. And you have a mm-hmm. female director of photography, Tammy Riker. Mm-hmm. It's unimaginable to think in that period where the story is set that anything like that could happen. Were you ever aware of how much change has come just on the set of this film and who was making it and the fact that they had a chance to tell this story? No, I'll tell you why. (laughs) Oftentimes we presume change has come, but when we're in the current times and still having the conversations we're having, when people Black people can still get lynched and there's no repercussions when Black people can still die at the hands of police officers without any real justice happening. When justice is often often contested as vehemently as it has been, there is no real change that's happened. Mm -hmm. Change is happening, but lest we get comfortable enough to, to understand that we still have work to do, change will never actually remain we are in a process right now where we have different opportunities because we've earned it we fought for it but we're still fighting and it's not comfortable the fact that we still have issues when it comes to racism in this country that drive this country that drive the laws that drive the politics something i often say that's a big shame about this country is that oftentimes laws have to be broken in order for equality to be met because this is the truth For us to all be in that room, we're doing a job. We're doing our service for ourselves and for our next generation. Change is happening, but change has to maintain. It has to remain. I don't look at what's happening now, the constant conversation. We've been having this conversation for years, ever since I was born, ever since my mom was born, you know. But right now, we are seeing some movement, but we're also seeing a lot of pushback. I mean, explain where we are. I don't even want to go into that. I'm not. But, you know, when when, it, when we look at where we are right now culturally, there is no cultural unification. And Black people are still being, we're dealing with degradation because of the color of our skin. We're, we're still dealing with being defined by the color of our skin. As I said previously, it's exhausting. So when I see years of consistency, 20, 30, 40 years, where we're dealing with a new problem, yeah, that's when I will acknowledge that change has happened. But right now, things have an opportunity to change, but we're still fighting for that change. So let's not get comfortable and let's not be dissuaded by the fact that what we see is is momentary. I know it can shift in either way, and I, I trust that it will shift towards the positive. I trust that it will continue to move towards progression, it won't be easy, it won't be without sacrifice. Unfortunately, this is the way, we've seen this with the 60s, we've seen this with the LA riots in the 90s, we've seen this with uh, you know, the 1800s when we were fighting for our own freedoms. Um, change isn't here, but it's happening. And I have the hope that we have the power to drive it to keep happening until it stays here. When you think about what Jim Brown, who we know is a football player and is an actor, mm-hmm. says about that in this film. We know what Malcolm X said. We know what Muhammad Ali said. We know a little bit about Sam Cooke and his music. Mm-hmm. We don't know a lot about what Jim Brown was fighting for and what was important to him. When you're going to try to find the soul of the man and the story that he wants to convey, what was the most important thing that you seized upon? And why is Jim Brown in 1964 as relevant as he is today. So uh, 
back in the 60s, Mr. Brown was the head of, he started the Black Economic Union, you know. Um, I think that with his experience being a major football star, then transitioning into a film and becoming a film star and understanding, you know, still what the issues were, he understood the power of economic power when it came to the Black community, because that is the one thing that we didn't have then. Um, that in terms of change, I can see that we, we do have economic power now, we just have to be out in front of it. We, we, our community needs to understand it more. We need to know it more. We need to, to engage it more, you know, in unity. But we don't have it nearly to a point where we deserve. So back then in the 60s, what I loved learning about uh, Mr. Brown and his, his actions, his activity, um, I was watching a bunch of, uh, I, I didn't watch any of his movies because I didn't want to see the character he was playing with himself. I watched mm -hmm. interviews because I wanted to see how he presented himself on the subject in person, you know. And he was very astute, very eloquent. Um, he knew his stuff. He, he kept a poise about him that was, was impressive. Um, he gave a speech, I believe it was 72, 74, something like that at UCLA, where he was speaking on the issues uh, within the film industry as a Black man, the lack of... of uh, equality that was there in terms of opportunity and pay and all this thing. Sadly enough, you can play that today and it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. The same, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, yep. I think he was just very ahead of his time. Yeah, yeah. I think he was just a very ahead of his time with being able to recognize where he stood and his place in the matter and actually use his voice to do something about it. And, and, you know, in terms of this film, where he's at and where his point is, you know, I think that all these men have differing points and the beauty about it is that they're all right. Right. You know, Malcolm's right, Sam's right, Cassius is right, Jim's right. They figure out where the difference is in their opinions and figure out how to make them work together, which is the power of this film. And that is the, the, the greatest teachable um, advantage we have with a film like this is how, again, how do we debate in, in terms of progression? It's not about who's right or wrong. It's about how is, how are the points that you have that are really poignant and, and, and powerful? How do we take that, take what I have and figure out how to push it? Because they're talking about cultural equality, cultural freedom, economic equality, economic freedom. Sam and Jim are more aligned on that because Sam at the time was doing things unheard of for a brother in his position or for anybody in the record industry at that time. He was a, he was a savant, you know, visionary. And Jim understood it because they spoke the same language when it came to economics. Now, how do we take that and push it towards what Malcolm was talking about and what Cassius was talking about when it came to cultural uh, uh, acknowledgement, you know? They were all aiming for the same target and they were hitting it. They were just shooting with different arrows. Right. And what you're saying, too, is that you can have differences and that doesn't mean the other person is wrong. It just means yeah. they have a different perspective. And that if you're all going mm -hmm. toward the same objective, you listen to what those people are saying. You incorporate your own beliefs into their yeah. beliefs and you try to come up with a strategy that it doesn't have to be you're right, yeah. I'm wrong or the other way around. <laughs> And yeah. as long as you keep your eyes on the prize, you You're work good. through those differences. I just started a podcast called Common Ground, specifically about that with my co-host, who that's how we found uh, our, our friendship and our working relationship over five years ago, was having just that conversation. We come from two very, very different backgrounds, but it's just that, you know, it's, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make a point for you to be wrong. I'm trying to make a point for you to understand who I am, to see my humanity, to connect. You know, if we had that, we'd have different changes, you know, and a lot of these judicial cases, you know, when they're fighting for justice for these black people who have been grossly abused by the law, the only thing that I think the primary thing that allows people to disconnect is because they don't see a human being. They see no relativity there. They don't see, you know, Trayvon Martin as their son or their nephew. They see, oh, well, I was taught that, you know, black people are this and that's, that's what I'm gonna think of them as. No, you, the real murderer, George Zimmerman is still out there walking. 
selling Skittles, selling the weapon that he used. And he's flaunting it, and nobody bats an eye. Are you kidding me? CS is human. That's what we're just looking. You know, it's, it's again, I, I'm very passionate about this. I, you know, get up in my feelings, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, I can't stress this enough, exhausting. I want to ask you one last thing, and that yeah. is about how you fill yourself up creatively. Because you're acting, you're doing podcasts, mm-hmm. you're producing, you're writing. But the things outside of that, what do yeah. they mean to you as an artist? You know, painting, designing watches, mm-hmm. reading books. How do you keep your creative soul energized? And how do those other things change the way that you approach art and keep you keep you fulfilled? So I've... Uh... I've come to believe that art is is the essence of who we are, right? We're sharing our spirit and our soul when it comes to us pushing out our art. Sometimes people don't see mediums of art as they truly are. Sometimes people are accountants, you know, and flipping numbers. They're like, oh, this is boring. I'm like, no, if you know how to flip numbers in a way that does magic, that's your art. You know, you know, sometimes people, people uh, don't feel like they have a, a creativity with what they're doing. For me, you know, everything that is done is creative. Everything that's built is, it took a, a degree of art to, to figure it out, right? So for me, I look at every, I look at, I look for the art in everything. Um, I, I don't look for inspiration directly because in times that I have tried, it's like you're trying to force something that can't come unless it comes naturally. You cannot actually force yourself to be inspired. You just have to simply acknowledge, accept, and and pay attention to what's around you. And then, inspiration will come. I go to my my instincts when it comes to interest. I always point towards what naturally intrigues me because I have a voracious appetite for knowledge. And the way that I move through the world is through what I learn and what where those things take me. You know, watchmaking specifically, I've been designing for a long, long time. And um, that my design technique or style rather comes from my original work with architecture. So I get to fuse both of those loves, but watchmaking has taken me all over the world and, and, and placed me around very different people. I've learned so much about different cultures and, and things like that through my efforts. And, um, you know, it's a very long journey, a very long, arduous journey, but uh, it's, it's something I, I stick with. And it just feeds me because it allows me to live in the seat of education through experience, a beautiful experience that I would otherwise never have a chance to, to see, you know, and, and I just love, like, it, it's, it's sort of um, my addiction to a degree, you know, I gotta, I gotta sketch, I gotta, I love going to museums, I love taking in and understanding and learning about different cultures, it's how I experience the world, and how I experience and learn more about myself. So I, I look for the art in absolutely everything because it's Aldi, there. Aldous, I could listen to you talk for another hour, mm-hmm. but your time is valuable. I want to congratulate about, yeah. you on the on behalf of the Middleburg Film Festival for receiving Thank this you. year's Spotlight Actor Award. Thank um, you so much. Man. I love this movie. It's very personal to me because my father was in the room with Malcolm X and Cassius Clay you told me. <laughs> as a young journalist at Sports Illustrated. Um, yeah, yeah. And I just think this is a really important movie. And I think the work that you're doing is equally meaningful. So it's a pleasure having you. Next time, we'll see you in person in Middleburg. Thank you. And you'll have a great visit that time. So best of thank luck. You. And thank you so much for sharing your time well, with us. Well, real quick, before I jump out, I just want to say thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody at Middleburg. Uh, thank the whole staff. Everybody, I really do. This means so much to me. I, I, I want to thank Sheila Johnson. And I want to thank Susan Coke. And I want to thank Connie White. And I want to thank you, brother. Um, this is huge. You know, the acknowledgement as artists for us to get any degree of, of, of any monochrome of not of acknowledgement is, is fantastic. And I thank you just so much for receiving what uh, we tried to do. And I'm just, I'm humbled and I'm grateful. And I thank you all.